Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So great to be here with the saints of the Lord. Thank you for being here, all our friends, family, visitors, to celebrate this first day of the week. We are looking at Acts chapter 23. Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem. That's where we're at. And in this portion of the book of Acts, he will be addressing the Jewish Sanhedrin or the Jewish court. This is the second of five pleas that he makes for people considering the gospel of the Lord. So even though Paul is now a prisoner, he's not in a favorable state, he continues to present his plea. He's pleading for people instead of for himself. He's still pleading for them to come and accept the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse one of Acts 23, we read, Paul stared at the Jewish council. He was taking them in, trying to see maybe if he recognized some faces there. And he says, brothers, my relationship with God has always given me a perfectly clear conscience. So the Sanhedrin, just to let you know, is the historic court of the Hebrews. It included probably some of the people who had condemned Jesus to death because it's not long that long afterward. They were no longer meeting in the sacred area where no Gentile was allowed to meet or to gather. They probably were meeting in a more public place because later on in this chapter we understand that there were some Roman soldiers that were escorting Paul before them and then taking him away, which would not have been possible if they were meeting in the most sacred place where no Gentile was allowed. So Paul is staring at every face there in the council, calling them brothers, trying again to find some common ground. He wants to make an appeal for the heart, where probably you and I would be concerned for our safety, maybe for our future if we were before a court of law. Paul is just saying, okay, how am, how am I gonna get these brothers to listen to the truth? That was his concern. It's not like he hasn't done this before. I mean, as he went through the synagogues, we saw in his previous missions, that was the very appeal that he was making before all the Jews when he was in his first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey. That's where he went first to the synagogues to make his appeal. So he's very experienced doing this right now. But for the second time though, he is addressing a tough crowd. He's addressing a crowd that wants to beat him up, wants to tear him up. Now, maybe now, see Paul is on the other side of where he was when they were stoning Stephen. Remember that? Where Paul was on the other side and now he's on the other side of that, getting to see this kind of crowd. Paul knew he had done some wrong things in his life, that he followed his heart at times. But notice that he says here, my relationship with God has always given me a clear conscience. And when we do a study of conscience, which is not what we're going to do today, but it is possible to have a clear conscience and yet be wrong with God. However, Paul is talking here about before God, God knows that all the intentions that I've had were to always please him, not necessarily me. And so Paul is making that appeal before them and before God, again, trying to get that common ground. I like what he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5, and I think he was thinking about this time, this speech, because if you read this verse, it's very similar in its vibe. He says here, it means very little to me that you or any human court should cross-examine me. Don't you think Paul was thinking about that time before he was the, before he was the, when he was before the Jewish Sanhedrin, they were cross-examining him. Now with the Corinthians, he feels like he's getting a little bit of that from them, which is why he writes this letter. And he says, look, 
I don't place any value in a human court. He says, I don't even judge myself. And another version would say it that way. Uh, He says, I have a clear conscience. But that doesn't mean I have God's approval. Important distinction. We could have a clear conscience, meaning I'm okay with what I'm doing. I'm okay with where I'm at. I feel I'm in a good place. I've heard many people say that as I share the gospel. You probably have too. But Paul is saying here, that doesn't mean I'm okay with God. And he makes that distinction right there. Then he adds, it is the Lord who cross examines me. Therefore, don't judge anything before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes, he says. We are constantly judging constantly evaluating as people cross-examine us, as we cross-examine them and make a judgment. But we have to realize that God is looking at us all the time. It is God who really cross-examines us and judges us. So Paul in this verse here, he brings up three tribunals before all men are, are, all men are before each of these tribunals at one point in time or another. He brings up the conscience. The conscience judges us, but people judge us too. But above all that, there is God himself. We have the court of public opinion, which has gotten a little nastier in this day and age with social media, <laughs> a place to hash out all our differences and all our opinions. But within the public court or the human courts, we also find human tribunals that go by law. Now, sometimes these opinions or these judgments, these cross-examinations that we get from other people, they might unsettle us a little bit. They might deprive us of developing our identity. They might insert thoughts. But we should not really let this human court unsettle us in any way or move our conscience. We should have that resolve. Paul had, he says, it matters very little to me what you think of me, Paul says. Paul was secure and sure in who he was because of his relationship with God, he says. Now that doesn't mean we don't respect the law. I wanna make that clear. Uh, the, God has given authority to the law and the courts of the land and they can hurt you. You you better be careful of that. You better be aware of that. However, even at that level, even though they've been given some authority, they still don't rule over our eternity. We have to be sure of that. Then we've got the conscience. That's another thing that Paul mentions here. The conscience, whereas uh, Paul talks about that in Romans 2, 14 and 15, where he says... Whenever non-Jewish people who don't have Moses' law, they by nature do the things that those laws contain. They are a law unto themselves. Paul here is doing a treatise on jurisdiction or jurisprudence, which is a great way to learn about the nature of law. Where does law really come from? And he says here that it really comes from the conscience. God has given everybody a conscience. That is a ruling party, a judgment, a tribunal within your very self that resonates with you when you do the right thing and that says you're guilty when you do the wrong thing. As he says in Romans 2, 15, their consciences speak to them, their thoughts accuse them on one occasion and defend them on another. And that's what our conscience is. It vibes with the truth, although We know that consciences can falter as some people have burned consciences, seared consciences as with a hot iron. So some, we can't rely on our conscience either. That's neither a good way or or something good to depend upon for reassurance, for hope. Now most people put their reassurance and their hope in the law. And we're a country who follows laws and we've got a lot of legislation going on. But should our hope be placed on that? Should our reassurance be placed on such a system that can falter so easily, that can accuse some people of being innocent and send them to jail even though they have done nothing wrong? What if you find yourself in that portion? Or what about the conscience? Can we really 
live an okay life even though we, our conscience might be clear? Does that necessarily reassure us or give us any hope, that fact that we might have a clear conscience? Well, what about the third and most important tribunal that is mentioned here? The word of God. According to Hebrews 4.15, God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it cuts deep. It's really the only spiritual weapon that can cut something that's physical, <laughs> a spiritual thing cutting through the physical, judging our thoughts and attitudes, getting right there deep where the soul and the spirit meet. If we are going to be people who accept and are ready to take in the reassurance and the hope that God gives during our trials here on earth, then it must be very clear to us as it was to Paul that neither human courts nor our own conscience can be reliable in doing such a thing. We need to be people, yes, whose consciences are clear. We do want a clear conscience. Thank God to Jesus Christ, as our brother was telling us in the lesson, Gerard, only by his blood has our conscience been truly clear. We cannot even clear our own conscience. But we can rely on him to do that for us. And therefore, now we are ready to pursue to letting the word of God judge us and clear us so that we can have that reassurance and that hope, particularly during the tough times, during a trial. I mean, what's harder to go through? Brothers and sisters, I've, been, I've gone through a lot of hard things in my life, but the things that have challenged me the most emotionally and intellectually and spiritually has been when I am before a human court. And I'm not talking about social media. I'm talking about people who were deciding my fate as to whether I was going to do this job or that. It can be quite unsettling. But in such a tough trial, I mean, even the word trial, we use that word for many different things, but what does that word really mean, trial? Doesn't it mean standing before a tribunal? Doesn't it mean going through a judgment of sorts? Yeah, it can be tough. And Paul was in a tough place right now. But let's see where his hope and his reassurance comes from. So Paul is here standing and the chief priest Ananias ordered the men standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you hypocrite. You sit there and you judge me by Moses' teachings, yet you break those teachings by ordering these men to strike me. Paul was unsettled, especially when this guy just comes and strikes him in the mouth. Of course, we contrast this with when Jesus went through such things. Jesus, I mean, <laughs> he had a calm demeanor, even through tougher things that he endured during his various trials. He had three trials, one right after the other. And it was not just hitting on the mouth. Worse things happened to me. However, I see here that even though Paul, of course, is responding like, like one of us would, maybe, you know, not in a good way. However, Paul, uh, God prophesied through him a truth, even at that moment. For Ananias later on was murdered by his own people at a time beginning uh, in the Jewish war that was to come. So maybe that was a prophecy that was issued by Paul's own reaction to this. Some men standing near Paul said to him, you're insulting God's chief priest. Paul answered, brothers, I didn't know that he is the chief priest. After all, scripture says, don't speak evil about a ruler of your people. So understandably, Paul has an outrage, has a protest, probably inspired, probably prophetic, but at the same time, he was very quick to humble himself because it was, after all, true, as he says here, don't speak evil about a ruler of your people. So Paul changes his strategy at this point. He realizes, wow, man, I'm, I'm, I'm here between a rock and a hard place. These people are not going to listen to what I have to say. They have no motivation 
to hear what I'm about to say. They just want blood. They're out for blood at this moment. What am I going to do before this court? What am I here to do? And so it says here, as he was observing before, we read in the first verse, he was taking in the faces, right? And he sees that there were two groups that becomes apparent to him. There were Sadducees and there were Pharisees. And so he shouts something. <laughs> Paul throws a little grenade into the crowd there uh, to upset them. He says, brothers, I'm a Pharisee and a descendant of Pharisees. I'm on trial because I expect that the dead will come back to life. Change the strategy there. And after Paul said that, the Pharisees and the Sadducees began to quarrel. The men in the meeting were divided. Why? Uh, the, Luke gives us a little parenthesis here, explain to us why the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in any of that. Whereas the Pharisees believe in all these things. So that was a big source <laughs> of division right there. Paul takes advantage, knowing his audience, takes advantage of those issues such as the resurrection of the dead. And this was a diversion, perhaps, that Paul is causing some confusion so that he can kind of regroup his thoughts, think of another way, another strategy to get them to th think about the gospel, think about what he has to say. And let me tell you something, to, to draw upon such a strategy, such eloquence, during such a highly stressful time, in a high stakes trial, surely was the guidance of the Holy Spirit. After all, didn't Jesus says, when you are put on trial in synagogues, in front of rulers and authorities, I mean, th Jesus is specifically addressing this very thing that we're seeing Paul go through. He says, don't worry about how you will defend yourselves, what you will say. At that time, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you must say. Of course, Jesus is directing this specifically to the apostles. They would get miraculous guidance from the Spirit. That doesn't mean that we're going to get miraculous guidance when we're before some kind of a tribunal. But it does mean that we do get reassurance from recalling the Word of God and being prepared when we are before such a high stakes trial. If we have been accepting of the reassurance and the hope of God's word, if, we've, if we're being disciples and sinking our roots deep into him, then when we face such things, we will be ready and we will have the strength to, grow, to go through such situations. We will be reassured by the word of God going through such things. So the shouting became very loud all of a sudden in the Sanhedrin. Some of the experts in Moses' teachings were Pharisees who argued their position forcefully. They said, we don't find anything wrong with this man. Maybe a spirit or an angel actually spoke to him. Oh boy, that's an in for Paul right there because there, it was a spirit who spoke to him, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. So that was a good thing. But the quarrel was becoming very violent and the officer was afraid that they would tear Paul to pieces. So he ordered the soldiers to drag Paul back to the barracks. So that was for another day <laughs> to be continued at this point. But it bought Paul some extra time, didn't it? So this was a strategy of the spirit that he you know, uh, was able to conjure up in such a high, highly stressful moment. So... Because of the dispute, Paul seems to gain a little bit of favor, even being given the benefit of the doubt here by some of the Pharisees. That's probably what he wanted, to buy himself some time so that he could continue preaching the gospel maybe on another occasion. But now, after this, is when Paul was going to get that reassurance and that hope. We see that in verse 11. The Lord stood near Paul the next night and said to him, don't lose your courage. You've told the truth about me in Jerusalem. Now you must tell the truth about me in Rome. Brothers and sisters, visitors, family, you know, sometimes we need to go and experience th these rough times. We need to go through stuff. We need to be kind of like 
be abandoned or feel that abandonment in that moment to understand that we must rely on God. We need to be in those moments where there are no more wits about us, where we've lost our marbles, where we're like, okay, there's no, nowhere else for me to go. We need to experience moments like that for our faith to be strengthened and for us to even get an idea of what reassurance is really about. Because we're not talking about material reassurance. We're not talking about emotional reassurance here. You know, those things come and go. We're talking about real hope here. The hope that is real hope because you can't see it yet. That's the hope we're talking about. Because a heart without hope, if we've lost our hope, or if we only hope in what we have, as the scriptures will say, then we're going to lose our spirit very easily. It's very easily to become a victim at that point of Satan's uh, plans and strategies. The Proverbs speak to that. Many Proverbs talk about this, but I've chosen two here to illustrate this. Delayed hope makes one sick at heart, but a fulfilled longing is a tree of life. A person's spirit can endure sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? And so right here, when he needed him the most, and it, as we read in the passage here, it's not like the Lord abandoned him. The Lord was always next to him. But the Lord says to him, hey, don't lose your courage. There's still more for you to do here. So whew, that fills Paul up with some more hope and some more courage. It's in the middle of a brutal fight that God reassures us when we're firmly planted in the word of God. Paul, again, writing about this, I believe very much, as I'm reading Acts in parallel with some of his epistles, I'm like, oh, I know where Paul got this one too from. I, I can see that. When he's telling the Corinthians in his second letter to them about this situation, he, I don't know if he was talking about this second plea that he's making or maybe in some of the other pleas that he's going to make before, but he says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be ignorant about the suffering that we experience in the province of Asia. It was so extreme that it was beyond our ability to endure. Now for Paul to say something like that, I cannot even imagine what is it that he went through. Because Paul has told us on a few occasions what he went through. And we wouldn't even want to experience a tenth of that. Beaten, you know, flogged three times, beaten with rods, being in a shipwreck. I mean, those things are terrifying. And now he was experiencing something that was so extreme that he was like, that's it. I want to die. That has to be extreme for the apostle Paul to say that. He said, we even wondered if we could go on living. We were ready to die at that point. Have you been in a situation like that where you're like, Lord, take me now? And I'm not just saying that because I know we sometimes say that and we're not really going through anything. You know, we, we heard, we stubbed our little toe or, you know, something insignificant like that. And we're like, Lord, take me now. Remember Fred Sanford <laughs> when he used to say that? Uh, so, but Paul here, he was in a situation where like, man, I, I really want to die. And we know that for Paul to say something like that, that was pretty extreme. Verse 9, he says, we still feel as if we're under a death sentence. Sometimes that feeling persists. Sometimes that's a season in your life where you're like, I mean, I'm going through a season that I feel condemned to death. That's a tough season to go through. He says, but we suffered the suffering had a purpose. And this is where hope and reassurance comes into the picture. We don't suffer needlessly like the world may. I mean, that's a tough situation for people without faith. When they go and experience something like that and there is no hope, there is no reassurance because they may be like Sadducees who don't believe in spirits or, or in the resurrection from the dead. Now that's a tough position. Who's going to help you then? Who's going to revive your hope and fear? Only if you're open to receiving that from the Lord, perhaps. That's how some of you came to the Lord, wasn't it? I heard some of your stories yesterday in the men's encouragement. And some of you were at the bottom of the barrel, at the end of the rope. 
And that's when Jesus sat next to you and said, hey, I'm here. And you looked up for the first time in your life. And we go through that, Paul says, so that we can stop trusting ourselves. We have so much, we do so much boasting. We think we're all that. We think we have these talents. We think we have these resources. We pull ourselves by the bootstraps, especially men. You know, men are like, ah, I'll do it. But we go through this suffering because God says, okay, you know, hey, try. Keep going. Let's see how long you can go for <laughs> before you hit the bottom of the barrel here. And he has a lot of patience with us. We need to stop trusting ourselves and learn to trust God. But I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to learn to trust God all sitting comfortably here. That's not going to happen. You don't learn to live being all comfortable. That's not going to happen. You're going to have to go through the hard things. So I'm warning you. I'm letting you know. If you're going to have real faith, you're going to have to go through stuff. And it's not going to be nice. It's not going to be pretty. But it will grow you. And the Lord Jesus is right there with you, encouraging you and seeing it through. Don't forget that. But to prepare yourself for that, pay attention to that third tribunal, the most important one, the word of God. Because that's what's going to get you through. And Paul and his entourage learned that at this time. And it's interesting, it's interesting to me, right? And I, I can sort of relate to it. I've been a Christian for a while, and I thought my faith was where it was supposed to be until I went through that really tough trial. And I'm like, Lord, really? I, you know, it's been, it's been some time. It's been a moment. Now I go through this. But then, of course, after going through that and forcibly being on my knees and forcibly fasting, not because I wanted to, but because I couldn't think of doing anything else but being on my knees, that, when you get to that point, it might be in your 10th year as a Christian, your 20th, might be your 30th, I don't know. But that taught me, whoa, I've got, I still got a lot of growing up to do. That's when you learn, yeah, I can't put my stock in anything else. Everything is caca, <laughs> everything. Everything except my faith. And when you can say that with conviction, okay, we're going somewhere now. We're getting there. We got to learn it. We have to learn to go through that. And then like Paul says in verse 10, he rescued me from a terrible death. Now I know he's going to rescue me in the future. And now he says, I'm confident. Notice confidence comes after the trial, the tough trial reassurance and hope come after the suffering there needs to be a crown of thorns before there's a crown of glory even our Lord Jesus showed us that didn't he and that's why Paul could say this quoting back from that time when he was praying with the Ephesian elders on that beach and where he said this where he declared this conviction I don't place any value on my own life I want to finish the race I'm running. I want to carry out the mission I received from the Lord Jesus. The mission of testifying to the good news of God's kindness. That's all that matters. Doesn't matter what car I drive, where I work. Nothing matters where I live, how much I get paid. See, when you can say that, you've been through stuff. And you know where your faith needs to be. It's... That's, that's how it is. That's a simple thing. Let's work. Let's work, brothers and sisters, on really being open to receive the true reassurance and the true hope that God gives because we are soldiers ready to carry out this mission, come what may. And that's how the church will grow into a strong church that's going to leave a legacy for generations that will glorify God. That's the only way it's going to happen. Onward, Christian soldiers. God bless you. And 
Remember that after, or right now, really, comes a time when you can come and pray with the elders that are going to be up here for you to lay down those burdens with them, lay down the things that are in between you and this mission that the God wants to have for you. Really lay it at the feet of Jesus by praying with our brothers. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Good afternoon, family and friends. Uh, We are at the point again in our worship service where we're called to participate in the Lord's Supper, a time in which we are all called to individually put our thoughts on remembering Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We partake of the bread representing his body that was given us and the fruit of the vine representing the blood that was shed for us. And preparing our minds this afternoon, I wanted to talk about prison escapes. From our youngest ages, we play games like Cops and Robbers or Manhunt. Both of these childhood games involve us finding our childhood friends and putting them into an imaginary prison. And those who are in this imaginary prison escape this prison by wanting their friends running around and tagging them out. And they go off and they run. They escape the prison. But in reality, prisons are not like this at all. Real federal or state prisons are supposed to be the most difficult places to escape from. And every successful prison break or escape that's occurred in recent history has involved a clever plan created by the captive prisoner to escape. These plans include using a small spoon to dig and carve escape tunnels miles in length. Or another plan that was successful was using a small crude piece of metal to chip away on a wall, to dig a a hole in the wall so they could escape through the hole in the wall. These plans devised by the prisoner usually take several years to accomplish and to come to fruition. Just think for a moment how much time it would take you to dig a prison hole miles in length using a tablespoon. And the interesting part of all of this is that after the prisoner escapes, the escaped prisoner is usually recaptured and placed back into prison. Maybe for a couple of months they escape, a couple of days. So all that plotting and planning really amounted to nothing. Or sometimes they actually die during the prison escape. So family, we were all prisoners at one point in our lives. We are all prisoners of sin according to Galatians chapter 3 verse 22 and each one of us devised and created our own escape plans using a measly spoon to labor, dig, and toil, creating our own mile-long escape tunnels to only get recaptured and enslaved again to sin. Our own burdensome escape plans brought us to the point of being spiritually, mentally, emotionally and physically exhausted because each time we tried to escape from our prison of sin using our own philosophies, using our own ideas, or our own good works, it quickly led us to be recaptured, crushing our motivation to even want to try to escape because each time we tried to escape with our new idea or plan, it led to an unsuccessful and fruitless escape. And we found ourselves in this personal personal prison of sin, unable to get out. But the scripture behind me, John 8, verse 36, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Because it says there, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see, the family, the pioneer or creator of prison escape planned the greatest prison escape when he created planet Earth and the first man and woman over, over 6,000 years ago. And the creator of prison escape, escapes was not even a criminal. He was actually blameless, without fault, and sinless. His prison escape plan was not to free himself, but us. The scripture in John 8, 36 clearly states, when we came to Christ, the Son of God set us free from our prison of sin And if Christ sets us free, we are free indeed. Other versions 
of this last part of the scripture and verse will say that you are absolutely free. That's a very distinctive word, absolutely free. Family, be encouraged that we are absolutely free from our prison of sin. And Christ did not use a spoon or a piece of scrap metal to dig a small escape tunnel. He used the power of God's love and a cross to utterly destroy and obliterate the walls of sin that once held me and you captive to sin. And not only for us, but for the whole world. So Sam, uh, family, we celebrate weekly our freedom from our prison of sin through Christ successfully accomplishing his purpose and mission during his brief 33 years on this earth. We know that he was brutally beaten and nailed to a wooden cross. But we also know after being placed in that dark tomb, he conquered death by being raised from that tomb. And what he accomplished for us, we will never fully understand or know. And now we are called to no longer be prisoners of sin, but if you read the sixth chapter of Romans, it says that we've now been slaves to righteousness or prisoners to righteousness. So families, we partake now of the Lord's Supper. Let our hearts and minds be truly encouraged. Let us have joy, gladness, awe, reverence. So many different emotions are mixed and wrapped up into this time, which remember our Lord. And just remember, if you are in Christ, no matter what has happened this past week, no matter what's happened today, if we examine ourselves now to realize that we are free from our prison of sin, we are absolutely free. Amen? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, what an amazing feat that Jesus did, setting us free, setting us free indeed from the power of sin. And as our brother shared, he didn't, he didn't use any tools to break us from prison. He didn't need any, any weapons of war to defeat his enemies, Father, but he gave himself, he gave his body, uh, Lord, it doesn't make logical sense to us, Father, but you set this course from the beginning so that we could be truly set free through the love uh, of your Son as displayed on the cross. And now with that freedom, Lord, we are free to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Thank you for bridging the gap that we couldn't bridge between us and you, that we can have relationship with you, and that we can have intimacy with you, and that we can celebrate this freedom together here as we take the bread. Thank you for Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Please bow with me as we pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Father in heaven, awesome God, we just uh, come to you thanking you, Lord, for uh, sending your son Christ to die on the cross for us, Lord. Um, as was stated in the lesson, his body and his blood uh, provided the escape from that internal prison of sin, Lord. And we just are uh, very thankful for you allowing us to have that ultimate gift. We pray right now as we take this fruit of the vine that we remember throughout this day and this week, the sacrifice that was made on the cross, the pain that was felt on our behalf, and the pain that we won't have to ultimately suffer because of your love for us and that ultimate sacrifice. We love you, Lord. We thank you once again. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let us all stand as we close out in song. Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love, God is love, love bears all things, believes all things, love hopes. All things and yours, all things. God is love, God is love, God is love, oh, God is love, God is love, God is love. God is love, God is love, God is love, oh, God is love, God is love, God is love, love the Lord, thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul all thy strength, all thy mind, love the Lord, thy God with all thy heart, for God is love, God is love, God is